Uh, welcome to Feza Gürse Institute Higher Structures uh, Seminar Series. Uh, today our speaker is Meng Chuan Tan from National University of Singapore. And his talk title is Waffa Witten Theory, Invariance, Fleur Homologies, Higgs Bundles, a Geometric Langlands Correspondence and Categorification. We thank Meng Chuan for being one of the speakers in our seminar series. Yeah, please Meng Chuan. Right. Thanks for the very nice introduction, uh, Ilhan, uh, and uh, and for the very kind invitation to 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 speak. Uh, I've, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, I've only transited in in Turkey, and I really hope to see this beautiful country one day. So uh, I apologize for the very long title. Uh, yeah, but I felt that you know if I didn't put all these things in, then it wouldn't do justice to this piece of work, which is you know a really uh, a rich treasure of many things that you can get from studying a pretty simple physical theory. I understand that most of the audience uh, would be mathematicians. So my approach to this talk would be to emphasize more on the clarity of the results. Okay, what the results, the definition of the results, uh, and just briefly go through the physical process or the physical strategy to actually get these results. Of course, for those of you who are more interested to know the physical way of getting the results, uh, the details are in the slides. You can also refer to the papers which I've appointed to. Um, and uh, so I, you can do that, you know, uh, after the talk is over. Okay. If not, at any point, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, okay. So let's begin. So for the outline of the talk, first, I'll give you some introduction and motivation why this work came about. Okay, and then I'll go on to the summary of results. Now, the summary of results is the most important section. This is where the I will flesh out the predictions that the physics gives, the mathematical predictions that the physics gives. Okay, so I'm a physicist by training. That's my education. So I work in this area called physical mathematics, which is different from mathematical, the traditional idea of mathematical physics. So physical mathematics, as you understand, as we understand today, as we define it today, is, is a physicist who makes use of a physical system using physical laws and then trying to make mathematical predictions from the physical results. Okay, so that's pretty much what I do. I mean, this field is not new. In fact, the first physical mathematician was Newton himself. So if you look at Newton, he was trying to study, you know, the motion of celestial bodies and the physics of, of moving uh, objects, right? Mechanics. And then from there, Calculus was formulated, you know, from the physical intuition of the rate of change and the work that's being done, the area under the graph and all those things. So in a way, uh, it's not a new topic. It's just that, you know, uh, since Newton to maybe like the early 20th century, mathematics and physics sort of got divorced from each other. But now there's a convergence again, where if you study things in quantum field theory, things in string theory, uh, then you will be able to do something like what Newton uh, used to do. 400 years ago. So that revival was kind of like, um, in a way, spearheaded by Witten. Uh, Witten was my mentor. I was his postdoc at EIS. And so uh, if you understand what kind of work Witten does, that's the kind of uh, work this will be about. Okay, so, so that's roughly the flavor of the talk. So summary results, very important. The main body of the talk would be explaining the physical calculations and the physical ideas behind how we got the results. And then I will conclude. Okay. I apologize that the slides are very dense. Uh, I will try to go slowly so you can read them. Uh, but I had to balance between you being able to look at the slides when this is over and getting enough information and also not making it too dense when you look at it now. Okay, so let's let's try. So, so in this talk, we will discuss this thing called the Vafa with a twist of a 4D N equals to 4 supersymmetric Young Mills gauge theory, SYM gauge theory on M4. Okay, so what this really means is that there are supersymmetric theories uh, in physics. And when we say twist, what we are trying to do here is uh, simply put, we are trying to study a certain sector of that physical theory. Okay, that means part of the spectrum, not the entire spectrum, but part of the spectrum. And that particular spectrum of the physical theory is the spectrum of the lowest energy states of the physical theory. Now, when the energy states are uh, at its lowest energy, uh, if the states are at its lowest energy, 
then they tend to be robust under topological deformations of the four manifold M4. Okay, so if you compute quantities involving these states of lowest energy, then when you deform the four manifold, the computations or the values that you compute, they don't change. So in some sense, you can derive topological invariance from physical theories by studying a certain spectrum, subspectrum of the physical theory. Of course, the entire physical theory does depend on the deformations of M4. Those that those states which are not lowest energy, they will not be robust to deformations. Okay, the lowest energy ones are stable to deformations of the four manifold. All right, that's what it means. So we will be studying the stable states, low energy states of the theory, which are robust under topological deformations of M4. And then from there, through its computations of various things involving these states, show that they can be interpreted as some novel mathematical object. That is the point of, 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 of this uh, whole piece of work. Okay, right. So the motivations for doing so are to derive a novel buffer witten invariant of M4. This is a topological invariant of M4. You can think of it as an elaboration of Donaldson invariance of M4. Okay. And if your four manifold is a product of two Riemann surfaces, then you can relate this uh, novel buffer witten invariant on, on, on the product of two Riemann surfaces to gromov witten invariants. Okay, gromov witten invariants. I will go more into that. Okay, uh, this 4-4-A model, N equals to 4-4-A model, is just uh, a two-dimensional model that continues to live on one of the Riemann surfaces after you shrink the other one. So why is it that we can shrink the other one? Because as I said, if you only focus on the spectrum of states which are robust to topological deformations, if you have two Riemann surfaces and you shrink one of them, that's still a, a shrink one of them to a small size, not to zero, but to a small size, Okay, it's still a topological deformation that leaves the states of low energy, you know, uh, robust and invariant. Okay, they they don't they don't they don't they don't modify themselves. All right. So after we do that, we want to derive a novel, okay, Waffa with an Atia flow correspondence. Okay, so uh what is the Atia flow correspondence? So the Atia flow correspondence originally is for the it's called the instanton Atia flow correspondence. Now, the instanton Atia flow correspondence is a correspondence between the instanton flow homology defined by Andreas flow, okay, and the Lagrangian intersection uh, flow homology. Okay, so flow homologies, are, there are many different variants. I'm not sure uh, how familiar you guys are uh, with flow homologies. It's a topic in geometric topology in mathematics. Okay, uh, so Atia flow correspondence is a correspondence between instanton flow homology and Lagrangian intersection flow homology. Now, so we want to find a generalization of that correspondence. So we end up getting something else. So we end up getting like a correspondence between not instanton flow homology, but rather Waffa witten flow homology and some other kind of Lagrangian intersection flow homology. Okay, so that's what we will get. So we will derive that physically also. And the main reason why we had this idea to do this is because uh, these two guys, Abu Zayed and Manolescu, they had a conjecture that said that, you know, they constructed this uh, hypercohomology of perverse sheaves, okay, in, in some modulized space of irreducible connections. And they showed that this construction of theirs actually uh, gives rise to a definition of instant flow homology, but for complex gauge groups. Complex gauge groups, okay, GC. Complex gauge group, okay. So when we did this Vafa witten Atia flow correspondence, we saw that this was one way to show that Abu Zayed and Manolescu's conjecture is true, that such a GC flow, GC flow homology, instanton flow homology does exist. Okay, I will explain a bit more later on. So of course, the other thing which we can also extract out of studying such a theory, this 4D and equals to 4, Theory. Now, n equals to 4 means there's four supersymmetries of the 4D theory. Now, physically, it is known that n equals to 4 theories enjoy this thing in physics called S-duality. Now, S-duality is the physics name, but mathematically, what it does, what S-duality does, is to swap the gauge group of the 4D theory with its Langlands dual. Okay? So, this 4D and equals to 4 theory 
if you study it and you make use of its S duality, it will be able to swap or map whatever you have in terms of G to those things in terms of LG, LG being the Langlands dual group. Okay, so that is the home of Langlands duality in the physical in, in physics. So of course, Langlands duality manifests itself in not just this area of physics, in two-dimensional conformal field theory, you see also four-dimensional gauge theory, but most elegantly in four-dimensional gauge theory of n equals to four time. And we will exploit that and then make predictions for Langlands duals of all these things that we are talking about, you know, uh, that I just mentioned about, right? So we obtain Langlands dual of invariance, pro homologies, hypercomology, and on top of that, we will also be able to reproduce the quantum and classical geometric Langlands correspondence. Okay, so this was first done in physics using gauge theory by Kapustin and Witten. They used a different 40 n plus 4 theory, or rather the same 40 n plus 4 theory, but looking at a slightly different spectrum of low energy states. We are looking at like this part of the spectrum, they are looking at a different part of the spectrum. Okay, but nonetheless, still 40 n plus 4. So they showed that, they first showed that physically you can get quantum geometric Langlands and classical geometric Langlands using this theory, using gauge theory in this way. Okay, they weren't the first to show that it appeared in physics, but the most, they, 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 were, first, they were first to show the correspondence uh, in, a, in a way that also involves mirror symmetry. Okay, so the Langlands correspondence is, is a very rich topic. Okay, I don't know if I have time to talk about it, but I you, you will see how it relates to mirror symmetry in a while. Okay, so the Langlands correspondence involving mirror symmetry, uh, that was first physically uh, elucidated by Kapustin and Witten uh, using this 40 n equals 4 theory, but studying a different spectrum of low energy states, okay, from us. But when we study this particular spectrum, the VW spectrum, we will also be able to get geometric Langlands, which is not surprising after all. And then higher categorification. So I see higher structures as part of the, the theme of this uh, seminar. So we will see some kind of categorification of, of this VW theory. Okay, so I was, I'll explain it quite clearly later on. So this talk is based on this work. Okay, and built on earlier insights by these papers. These are essentially mostly physics papers. They are physics papers, um, mostly physics papers. As I said, you know, the approach is physical. So what the takeaway from this piece of work is that I'm showing you the mathematical predictions of the physics. Okay, right. Okay, let's look at the summary of the results. Now, if the scalar curvature of M4 and the gauge group G, okay, uh, of the theory, this is a real compact D group first, a real compact D group, okay. Geometric Langlands is in terms of complex groups, but I will tell you how you, we can transition to the complex version, okay. But but the physical theory itself is defined for real compact D groups, G, okay. If the scalar curvature and the gauge group G are not simultaneously non-negative, and locally a product of SU2s. Yeah. Okay, so this is the condition that we will assume. Okay. The theory, the physical theory, will localize onto a modulized space of configurations satisfying the VW equations. I will show you what the VW equations are. But the point is this. We compute something called the partition function of the physical theory. Okay. The partition function, in some sense, is like the vacuum energy of the physical theory. We have nothing inside. Okay, you don't put anything inside, like in the, in the space of M, M, a four manifold M four as a physical theory that is uh fine on the four manifold, and you want to compute the vacuum energy, okay, of the physical theory. So that's what it means here, with nothing inside. Okay, and why is why is there still energy when there's nothing inside? Because quantum mechanically, things can appear and disappear from nothing. So therefore, there is still energy that's being created from there. Okay, so so that is what this partition function is computing, all right? So let's look at the data here. So we have M4 data here. We have a group G, real compact Lie group G here. And tau, this is a complex number, okay? And then we compute this guy called partition function. We get an expansion like this, okay? It's a Q series. The MK here are integers. The AK here are numbers, possibly rational, okay? And then your Q here is 2 pi i tau. You can think of the tau as like, you know, the modulus of a torus, something like this, right? Yeah, so Riemann surfaces, you, in the theory of Riemann surfaces, you have this as the, you know, the, the complex structure, right? So you can think of it as being valued, you know, uh, uh, on a Riemann surface, on a torus, okay? So you have this here, okay? So this is the expansion here. 
that we have. So K denotes the thief sector of the modulized space MVW. Okay. So and of the VW equations. Now, this modulized space here is not zero dimensional. Okay, it is it's, it's got some dimension. It's not points, it's got some finite dimension. Okay, this is the modulized space of the equations, which I will show you later on the VW equations. Now the number here, okay, is is uh integration of a top form over the modulized space in that sector. So a different sector, the modulized space will have different dimensions. And then for the different dimensions, different sectors, you know, labeled by K, we have a top form that integrates over this guy to give you a number. Okay, so this is the exact, you know, mathematical expression for this thing. Okay, where this is a zero form on the moduli space, which is a function. Okay, B here is a coordinate on the moduli space. One plus B to the power of four, to the power of the complex dimension of this uh, moduli space. Okay, so this is a zero form wedge. This guy here, this is a sine Euler class of the tangent bundle. Okay, it's a sine Euler class of the tangent bundle. And, and this together here is actually a top form over this guy of this dimension. Okay, so this is, is this is the precise definition of what this AK is. This, um, okay, I will explain, I will show you, I will tell you what in our results so far mathematicians have tried to prove. And there is a guy, you could ask him to come and give you a talk if you wanted to, that's tear off. Uh, recently in a paper in uh, last year, I think, you know, he saw our results and he tried to prove it and he proved uh, some of our results rigorously mathematically. Okay, so that's how the process is. We supply mathematicians with predictions. Okay, if you're interested enough, you can try to prove them rigorously, you know, that forms the basis of a new project. And so uh, some results later on have actually been proven rigorously. Okay, so now this one here, AK, there has been an approach by people like uh, Richard Thomas and Tanaka, so they were studying something like Waffa Witten invariance also. Okay. So their approach, they have something like this also, a generating function of their invariance, right? But they make use of algebraic geometry. Okay, so they have a Higgs sheath, you know, and then they computer some using some virtual localization of the Higgs sheath. And so they got some numbers also like this. Okay, those numbers were rational. But the expressions were not like this. So what we are offering here is a non-algebraic geometric uh sort of uh, expression, a differential geometric, okay, in terms of wedge of forms. For, but for those, they are looking at uh, sheaves and some, some kind of class, some, some virtual sheaf class and all those things. So I've spoken to Richard and I've, I've, I've tried to discuss these results with him and we do see some connections between these two things. Although at this point, because the manifestation of the formulas are slightly different, so it's not yet clear how they are connected. And besides, uh, that was a purely mathematical approach there could be some subtle differences, but nonetheless, the point is we can all agree that this will give you some generating function that's worth studying. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so good. So that's the Waffa Witten invariant here. Okay. In the past, if you read the original Waffa Witten invariant papers, uh, I mean Waffa Witten, uh, the paper in 1994 tried to generate something like this also. Uh, but for those of you who are familiar with that piece of work, then this guy here will be integrated over the moduli space of instantons, self-dual connections. So the departure is in that we are no longer studying the case where it's instantons, but rather something more than instantons. Okay, the waffa witten equations are not just F plus equals to zero, not self-dual connections only. Okay, it's not just that. There are other things inside. Okay, there's a, there's a B field that's also inside. Uh, two, uh, two form. Okay, uh, two form field. Okay, um, so we are studying the more general version. And therefore, AK is not integrated over the volume space of instantons. So what Fafai written did was to get an expression that looks similar to this, but without the omega zero, okay? Because the B doesn't exist. And then it's just this. So our result will collapse or will specialize to Fafai Witten's uh, original result, okay? The simpler one when our B is zero, okay? So this also tells us that this equation is consistent in that sense to a previous one, okay? And when Waffa and Witten studied, you know, this guy here in this form, their purpose was actually physical. Uh, that was physical. They wanted to have some kind of expansion in Q 
and they wanted to test the modular properties of this uh, cube expansion. So they wanted to do some modular transformations of the tau here. Okay, so tau to tau minus one over tau, tau to tau plus one, SL two Z transformations of tau. Okay, and then to see whether this guy here transforms as a modular form, and if it does transform as a modular form or a perfect modular form, then it would mean that this guy here is a uh, modular invariant and therefore uh, S-duality, which is a conjecture of Vafa Witten theory, of, of N equals to 4 theory. It's, all, it's still a physical conjecture. We only have some, you know, sort of uh, pieces of evidence that it is true. But if it's modular invariant, okay, if this guy is modular invariant, then it would mean that the conjecture is actually rigorously correct, rigorously true, okay? So when you do a modular transformation of this guy, you're affecting the S-duality in the physical theory. And if it remains invariant, if this guy remains invariant, in other words, if the vacuum energy remains invariant, okay, uh, under the transformations of tau to minus one over tau, then it would mean that the physical theory itself is uh, S-dual, has its S-duality, okay? The vacuum energy doesn't change. So that was their motivation. But the offshoot, again, is that they were able to come up with a generating function of some you know, uh, uh, numbers here, which were uh, Euler class over the modular space of instantons or self dual connections. Okay, so that was that was the buffer written invariant in the old days, but this is a new one, the latest one. Okay, so then we compactify VW theory, the 4D theory on an M4 that is a product of two Riemann surfaces, as I mentioned. Okay, so uh, the Riemann surface here is sigma cross C, okay. Uh, when I say compactify, I mean this. We consider M4 to be this. And then later on, we shrink this guy here. Okay, so as I mentioned, the theory is topological because the spectrum of space that we are interested in are robust to topological deformations. Okay, so we can do this. And physically, the theory remains invariant. So we can make connections between the theory when you, before you shrink C and when you have a shrunk, shrunk C. Okay, so that's, that's the thing we can do in the physical theory. Mathematically, you can't really make this statement just like that because we don't have the machinery of a topological kind of a theory, you know, uh, to make use of this principle. But in physics, we can do this. So, uh, so sigma is genus one and C is genus two or greater. Okay. So why this constraint? Because uh, physically, we know that the index of the N equals to four theory that we're studying uh, is zero. There's this thing called the index. So the point is that there's this thing called a virtual dimension associated with the modular space, okay? That virtual dimension of the modular space is zero. Uh, and because of that reason, a physically sensible theory will be one, whereby G equals to one when we shrink C, okay? So this is dictated by looking at the consistency with mathematical results and what we have physically, okay? So the cho correct choice will can only be G equals to one, but C, we could choose anything. We could choose anything we wanted, but we choose greater or equal to two because eventually we know that when we shrink C, our data that we get would be some Hitchin uh, equations on C, okay? And we don't want to deal with the complicated situation where the Hitchin equations have reducible connections and all that. So genus two or greater will give you well-defined Hitchin equations and therefore well-defined modular space of each equations. That's why we make this choice G with or equal to two. But of course you are free to choose G equals to one and complicate your life, but we, we, don't, we have decided not to. Uh, maybe some people can study that. Okay, so anyway, once you shrink the C to very small, then what happens is that physically, effectively, you only see this guy. C is not, not zero yet, okay? There's not, no, no such thing as absolute zero. We're not shrinking at, at two, we're not shrinking the C away to zero. If we shrink C away to zero, it will not be a four manifold anymore. C is just much, much smaller than sky, okay? And because we're looking at the low energy states only, we can look at it from a very far distance. Okay, low energy means in, in, in physics, means you're looking at far distance. And if you look at far distance, the theory looks effectively two-dimensional on this guy here. And on this guy here, a two-dimensional theory is a different quantum field theory. Okay, we call it an A model. We know it's an A model. Okay, so this is actually a string theory. So a string lives on this thing here. Okay, a string worksheet. So a string propagates in space-time and it sweeps out a sheet, right? 
So you can think of this sigma here, g equals to one, right? It's a torus as a closed string going around on itself. Okay, so actually a string theory lives here now. If you shrink C, it looks like a string theory on this guy. Understand? So like a circle, uh, a closed string that's going around itself. And you realize that it is a different kind of string theory. It's a topological string theory. Okay, so it's an A topological string theory whereby the target space, in other words, the effective space that the string sees is actually Hitchin's equations, moduli space of Hitchin's equations. Okay? And the complex structure with which the string is seeing the moduli space of Hitchin's equations is the complex structure I. So Hitchin's equations, the moduli space of Hitchin, MGH here, is a hyperkähler manifold. So it's got three complex structures, I, J, and K. So if you were to view MGH in I, J, and K, they will look like different things. Okay, so in complex structure I, then the moduli space of Hitchin's equations will look like the moduli space of Higgs bundles. Okay, so if you look at moduli space, if you look at it from the complex structure J, then MGH will look like the moduli space of flat GC connections on C. Likewise for K. And any linear combination of, of J and K. Okay, so that is how Hitchin's uh, moduli space can look different in different complex structures. So we do our computations in physics and realize that the string sees the moduli space in its complex structure I. Therefore, we have here, we can deduce that actually is looking at the moduli space of Higgs bundles on uh, Higgs pairs, if you will, right? So you have a, a one-form connection, a uh, one-form, uh, a separate one-form that is not a connection of a principal G bundle on the the Riemann surface C, and then it, the data is A comma phi, for example, right? Yeah, you don't combine them together. The Higgs pair, basically. So we had this 4D theory, which is equivalent to the same 2D theory when we string this. Now, the 2D theory that lives on the sigma is a string theory, as I mentioned, where it sees this as the target space, the ambient space around it. Okay, and this guy, you can compute it to be uh, uh, this, the energy of the string, okay? The vacuum energy of the string, can also be computed to be of this form. Okay, some kind of a series in Q. So, and L here, now it denotes the moduli space, the sector of the moduli space of holomorphic maps from sigma into M Higgs. Okay, so for genus one, right? So sigma is genus one. And these numbers are known to be rational. Okay, this for sure. Right, because this is well studied. Okay, a moduli space of maps, you know, for genus 1 into uh, mpx, that is known to be a rational number. Okay, so this is a gromo witten invariant. So basically, this is a gromo witten invariant, actually. Okay, so this is a generating function for gromo witten invariant. Okay, and this, these are the gromo witten invariants. Right? So, and likewise, E is a sign order class, okay, of the vector bundle with fiber. It's a side, side complication here from the earlier one. So, it's a sign order class of the vector bundle, where the fiber is given by this guy, right? A global section of this guy here over the, 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 the sigma, the genus one Riemann surface. Okay, this is the canonical bundle of the, of the Riemann surface. Now, this guy is a pullback, okay, of the cotangent uh, bundle of the, the space of holomorphic maps onto the sigma. Okay, so we have a map from sigma, okay, into into uh, 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 into this guy here, okay? So then you have a pullback of this guy, okay, uh, on, uh, uh, onto, onto sigma itself. So that's a, that's a double pullback, okay? So this is the standard definition, if you see, of global filter invariance. The only thing is that now we have uh, the global filter invariance of MPX, okay? So this is a standard definition. Okay, so then we consider another possibility for the M4. Another possibility of the M4, okay? We consider M4 to take this form. All right, M3 cross R. I mean, R plus, okay. So I would say mathematically, you just consider it as M3 cross R. Okay, forget the R plus, but M3 cross R. Okay, so that's that's easier for you to understand. Okay, the reason why I wanted to add an R plus here is because we wanted to be in line with the concept of adding a boundary, okay? But strictly speaking, it's just M3 cross R, okay? So M3 is a closed three-manifold. Now, 
So when we write the physical theory or express the physical theory uh, on a four manifold that takes this form, we can re-express the physical theory as a theory only along the R. Okay? So that's what we can do in the physical calculation. And when we do that, we end up getting a quantum mechanical theory. So from a four-dimensional theory, we are now re expressing it as a one-dimensional theory that lives on R only. The M3, the data, can be hidden inside the physical theory. Okay, so that, that, that can be done. Now, when you actually do this, we can physically realize again by computing uh, the vacuum energy, okay, the partition function, which is actually computing the vacuum energy, okay, um, we can actually realize flow homology. Okay, flow homology as it's known in mathematics. Okay, we have a physical algorithm to actually generate flow homology classes. Okay. We have a physical algorithm to generate flow homology classes. And uh, this is how you do it. So, I mean, this is symbolically. So, of course, the physical steps uh, I will detail in the main body of the paper of this, this talk. Okay, so this guy will give rise to a generating function. And these are flow homology classes. Okay, and then we write the generating function of homology classes as this. So then the next step that we will do is this. We want to split this guy into two parts. Okay, we want to split this guy into two parts. How do we do that? We he got split this M3 here. Okay, along a Riemann surface. Okay. So once you split that into two parts, then the M4 will be two blocks split at C and the M4 will be two blocks and the face of the two blocks would be C cross R. Okay, I will show you a diagram later on because this is a bit confusing in words, but the point is that you have two blocks. But when we do that, after we split them into two blocks and then we shrink, further shrink the C and all this is allowed because we are in a topological theory, then we end up getting a two-dimensional theory that would produce for us Lagrangian intersection flow homology. And because the process is equivalent from a physical point of view, we have this correspondence, this isomorphism of the states that we are talking about. Okay, yeah. So you get this guy here before you split the guy, split the thing. And then uh, you, after you split and you shrink C, then we get this, this thing here. So this Lagrangian intersection flow homology I think first appeared in Salaman and uh, Fukaya and those people, they, they define this. Actually, this definition of uh, flow homology, Lagrangian intersection flow homology, came from a, a, a need in string theory, actually, believe it or not. Okay, So string theory stumbled upon brains, and then we had open strings that ended on the brains, and we wanted a way to rigorously compute the string excitations between the brains. And so we couldn't really find a uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, the correct mathematics for it. And so mathematicians saw this is what we were needing to do. And then they formulated this thing. And that helped us to, you know, get some rigorous result on, 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 on open string spectrum, basically. Okay. So anyway, the point is that, you know, the, the splitting and the shrinking of C does nothing. So you can, you can, you can relate the original theory that we got from here to this one that we get after we split and we shrink. Okay. So, now, this is the RTR flow correspondence. But now, you can see that on this side here, it's not instanton flow homology. Okay, it's a VW flow homology. Okay, again, related to M3 and, and some G and tau. Okay, so we have this parameter tau here, which is will be useful because we can do modular transformations of this guy. Okay, and then this isomorphism to the Lagrangian intersection flow homology of this guy. So, you have this space here, your Lagrangian uh, many folds, some many folds of this space, two of them here, and these guys here intersect each other, and this Lagrangian intersection flow homology counts the intersection points of these two Lagrangian cycles. Okay, so that is how uh, this Lagrangian intersection flow homology is defined. They are generated by the intersection points of these two Lagrangians. Okay. So what happens when we get this is that. So Abu Zayan and Manolascu, they 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 constructed this hypercohomology of a perverse sheaf, okay, 
of vanishing cycles in the body life space of irreducible fat as autosy connections on M3. And this construction was shown by some people to be equivalent to this guy here. Okay? So that is mathematically rigorous, basically. So people have shown that, that this guy here is actually you know, isomorphic to this guy here. So from our result, this is isomorphic to this. It means that this is isomorphic to uh this is sorry. This is isomorphic to this one. Okay, so we get this. All right, so it might be a bit confused. It looks a bit different, right? Okay, so later on we will show, we will see that this guy here is actually the same as this guy here. Okay, it is the same as instanton flow homology but for complex gauge groups. Okay, complex D algebra. D group. Okay, GC. Yeah. So, so Abu Zayed and Bonanascu, they, they conjecture this for SL2C, but our physical theory shows that you can also get this for other G. Okay, not just SL2C. So in that way, we kind of find some physical corroboration of their conjecture. Right? Then we continue the story. We use S duality of this N equals to 4 theory. Okay? We use S duality of this N equals to 4 theory, which implies a Langdon's duality, as I mentioned before. The group G goes to the LG group. Okay? And so we will get some maps of all the Zs in terms of Gs, in terms of like LG, basically. Okay? So we will get like a map. And even for this result here, we can get a map from GC to the result for LGC. Okay, superscript LGC, Langdon's dual group. Okay, so we get a Langdon's duality of, of this uh, RTR flow correspondence also. Okay. Now, then when we change M3, or rather we assume M3 is an interval cross C. Okay, so let's say from here, right? We take M3 to be interval cross C here. And then take C to become small. So what we will be left with is I cross R. That's a 2D theory left. Okay. A 2D theory that is open because you have interval cross R. Okay. This is, is open strip. It's a strip. Right. And we have the string that is a strip. And once you have a string that's a strip, then there'll be brains, basically. The brains are the boundaries of the strings. And then we have a category of brains. So open strings define a category of brains. Okay, not just one brain, but a category of brains. Okay, uh, and category of brains on this guy. And then S duality will change this guy, G, to LG, as I mentioned. It will change this parameter tau here to minus 1 over ng tau. This is the lacing number of the group. So you can see there's a modular transformation also from this guy, this guy here. Okay, that's insisted by the physics. And why is there something like this? Because tau is actually like something like, you know, 4 pi i over g squared. Like the g is the coupling of the theory. S duality flips the coupling to the other side, the inverse from numerator to den denominator. And this results in this kind of transformation. Okay, so that's the reason why you have this. So there are any nice coincidences in the physics with mathematical kind of definitions of transformations. Okay, so that's the point here. Okay, so we have this identity here. Okay, this correspondence here. Now, if the real of this tau, this is a tau is a complex number, if the real of the tau equals to zero, so essentially, you know, this means when the G is very, very, very large, okay, then what happens is that we will get the result will reduce to this. Okay, so the result of this guy here will reduce to this. Now, if you look at this, this is the quantum geometric Langlands correspondence. So what is this? So here, Okay, this bun GC, you can take it as the stack. Okay, it's technically it's the moduli stack, okay, of GC bundles 
on the rebound surface C. Okay, right? That's genus 2 or greater. Okay, there is this Q parameter inside uh, that is, you know, part of the Langlands correspondence. It's related to the tau. Okay, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's related to it. Okay. And then this guy here just means D modules. Okay, D modules on this space. Right? And C here just means a uh, uh, category of D modules. Okay, and minus HV here is uh, basically there is a line bundle that is twisted by this guy here. H is the HV is the dual coxeter number of the group. Okay, uh, that's that's involved in defining this D module. And so we get this correspondence, and this is exactly the quantum geometric analysis correspondence. Okay, it's actually from GC to LGC, Q to minus one over NGQ, and then dual coxeter number becomes a Langlands dual coxeter number. Okay, so you have a, actually a correspondence of categories. Now, in the classical tau to infinity limit, tau to infinity means that your G, okay, uh, your, 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 sorry, your G is uh, uh, very small, okay? So G is actually the coupling of the quantum field theory. And if the coupling is very small, that means the quantum interactions are, uh, are, are small and therefore you are in the classical limit. This guy here will reduce to this guy here. Okay, now this is the classical geometric Langlands correspondence, which is more asymmetric. So between these two results, this is an easier result actually to prove mathematically. So the quantum geometric Langlands correspondence is actually easier to prove because it's actually a more symmetric result. Okay, whereas the classical geometric Langlands is actually harder to prove because it's asymmetric. Look at this. It doesn't look the same. So here we have, you know, basically uh, still a category of D modules whereby this parameter now goes to zero. Okay. And when the parameter goes to zero, we call it critically twisted. Okay. Uh, uh, D module. Okay. But this guy here is a completely different thing. It's a category of coherent shifts on MGC flat. Okay, so, so it's quite different. This bun GC here, which is just the more space of more stack of bundles, but this is here flat bundles only and GC flat bundles. So it's quite different basically. So this is highly asymmetric and this is the geometric language correspondence that was first introduced by Belisson and Drinfeld. Okay, so Belisson and Drinfeld, they, they wanted to uh, 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 geometrize the arithmetic language correspondence and the first time they did that was in this case. This came later, you know, when people wanted to study a more symmetric version that was easier. So the original one is actually this one, which is highly asymmetric. Okay. So, but nonetheless, in our uh, physical machine, we are able to get these things. So as a mathematician, maybe you can understand all the terms that I'm talking about. But, you know, I mean, as a physicist, you'll be saying like, why, why, what's, what's, I mean, all these brains, how, how, how they even become like coherent sheaves and all that. So that's a dictionary, okay? Brains of a B type, uh, coherent sheaves and all that. So that's a dictionary that's established. And how, why is that a dictionary? Because the physical conditions on the brains, like, you know, some vanishing line bundle above it, because there's a few strength that vanishes, you know, a vanishing curvature of a line bundle because a few strength vanishes. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence translation with a, uh, with a mathematical definition of what these objects are, okay? So that's how... I would say this to a physicist. Okay, now, so you observe this thing. We started with this, right, earlier on, ZVW on M4, right? We computed the partition function of the VW theory on M4. Okay, and so we uh, we didn't consider M4 to be anything, just generic M4. Then later on, we consider M4 to be M3 cross R, remember? So once we included M4 to have a boundary. The M3 is in some sense like a boundary. We, we took it as R plus, right? But really we are studying M3 cross R. Okay, like phi infinity, you have boundary of M3. So M3 cross R, phi infinity, past and future, the two ends of R, you have a boundary, okay, of M3. Then you see that what did we get? We get the this guy right here. We get a genetic function of this guy. Now this guy is the flow homology. But the flow homology class is a vector. So this guy here was a number. 
then in the end, we get a summation that involves a vector. I mean, strictly speaking, in the physical theory, it's still a number. We get an expectation value of the vector. That just means that we convert the vector into some number, basically. Okay, so we are still always still getting a number, but the point is, the number is given by the value of some vector, basically. So the so from here, from a number, we become like a vector. And then if you remember, we took the M3 to be I cross C. So we take the boundary M3 to introduce boundaries to the M3. I cross C, so interval cross C, right? And C therefore is now the boundary. We are introducing two boundaries to the M3. You know? And then we got this one, the brains. So we get a one category here of the brains. Okay, then we can continue to do this. We can continue to let C be interval cross S1. You know, and then shrink the S1. Okay, so here we 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 shrank the, the, the C here to get this one. Then now we can shrink the S1 to get, you know, the, the two category basically. So we can go on and on. Of course, there's a limitation. It will truncate once you, you know, once you you fill up, once the boundaries become four dimensions. Okay, then, 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 then that's the end. So in this case, we have up to three category. Okay, which I will explain. Uh, uh, I'll show uh, quite shortly. Okay, so the point is you can categorify it in this sense. Okay, so the, the physical language, the physical recipe for categorification for highest to see high structures is to essentially decompose the manifold into subparts whereby there are boundaries or boundaries or boundaries or boundaries. Okay, so that's the that's the takeaway. All right. So here we get a two category of module categories over the Fukaya uh, uh, category of, of T2. I'll explain this in more detail. I think this is something probably you guys are more interested in. Okay, so the results that I've all mentioned are actually in, in summarized here. Okay, so you can see that the takeaway is that the physical theory is, you know, just by studying a spectrum that is of minimal energy, that's robust to topological deformations, you can actually get a lot of mathematics out of the physical computations. Okay? And, and that's because for every physical quantity that you compute, for every physical, like the field strength is actually a curvature to form on a line bundle, you know, a gauge field is a connection on, on a line bundle. So there are many sort of... Uh, you know, translations of what uh, those physical things mean in mathematics. And as a result, we can say something mathematical because of that. All right. So actually, the physics is rather straightforward. Uh, believe it or not. Yeah. But the mathematical predictions are highly non-trivial. Okay. Of course, this is still not a rigorous, you know, proof that these things exist. But it is a source of inspiration and ideas for people to go and explore and to check out and as I mentioned, this part here, okay, I forgot to mention just now. Uh, this one here has been proven. Okay, this guy here, this one has been proven, actually. Okay, so somebody did a calculation to compare this guy here with this guy here. And it was a recent paper last year. After seeing our, this paper came out in, in, in 2000, in 20, uh, 2022. So in 2023, a year later, somebody tried to prove it. And uh, that's that off. Yeah, Dennis, that's that off. And it's in his paper and he showed that it is correct. Okay, using just rigorous computations, mathematical computations. Okay, so that's one thing that people have proven. Okay, yeah. So we have all these predictions that the physical theory gives. All right, I understand that I've taken up quite a bit of time, but I think that was necessary to go at this pace so you can sort of understand everything, you know, uh, clearly. Okay, the rest are just details. I mean, as I said, these details are physical in nature. Uh, you know, let me just go through them very briefly. Maybe, maybe about ten minutes. I'll just go through them very, very, very briefly. I shan't, I shan't go into like great detail into this. For those who are more interested, you can read it on your own. Okay, so the equations, the buffer Witten equations that we were talking about were, were were these equations. Okay, so this is a two form. This is a self. Uh, the 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 positive part of the 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 curvature two form of of some uh, principal G bundle. Okay, over M four, and uh, and C here is actually a scalar. So this is the waffle witten equation. But waffle witten equations, if you look at the moduli space, they are, if your C, if you include C in the 
the the the the, the equations and you study this, then there will be reducible connections and the moduli space will not be well defined. Okay, so what we did was to set C to zero because ultimately we are guided by the fact that the physical theory must make sense. And if a moduli space has irreducible connections and singularities, that makes the theory ill-defined. So physically, we need to study the case where C equals to zero, right? So occasionally we will need some mathematical facts to guide us on what is the correct thing to study in the physics. Okay, so this is one of them. When I say C equals to zero, I don't mean C equals to zero in the entire theory. C equals to zero of the zero mode of the quantum field theory. Of course, this is not something easy to understand, you know, just like this, but you can think of it as the classical dynamics of the quantum field C does not exist. C is a purely quantum field with only very small fluctuations. Okay, so that's one way you can understand it. All right, and I mentioned that the scalar curvature of M4 and the gauge group not being simultaneously non-negative and locally a product of SU2s, yeah, that is a requirement that's needed so that we can study B. Okay, B, B doesn't vanish in this situation, right? Uh, this uh, condition was actually first derived by Waffa and Witten in using these things called vanishing theorems. And these vanishing theorems are essentially almost mathematical computations. They're not really physical computations. They're taking the mod squares of some terms in the action and then making sure that the energy of the mod squared terms will decay to zero as they go to infinity. Okay, so that's something that's quite typical in differential geometry where they take terms mod squared and then they want the term to be square integrable and therefore they want them to decay down and not like, you know, basically increase and, 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 and go in infinitely large. And then that's the condition that they got for this thing here, the two form. Okay, so you more or less saw this before. The other thing which you didn't see is this MK. So this is what we call the, the corresponding VW number. It's an integer, okay? The MK is an integer. So it's just an elaboration, uh, a generalization of the Pondragon class, right? So the FHF over one over A pi squared, uh, the instant number, okay? So this is an integer itself. So if an expansion of Q to powers of integer, and here is the Waffa return invariant, which I already uh, mentioned just now here. Okay, so this is the part where we talk about how when you shrink the C, then you end up getting a two-dimensional theory that's left over on sigma and all that. And these are all physical calculations. But uh, to give you an, a flavor of how we do that, the metric of the four manifold, we write it because it's a product space, so we can write it as a diagonal matrix. And then we append a scaling factor to one of the, the lower diagonal of that matrix you know, in our physical theory, the, and in the physical theory, there's this thing called the action, which the G will feature inside. We take the epsilon to become very small, and then we see the terms in the physical theory that become ill-behaved when epsilon is very small, and then we find the conditions to make sure that they still well-behave. So it's guided by the fact that we expect the physical theory to be well-behaved, okay? So that is the guidance of why we find the conditions for it to be well-behaved, and we find the conditions to be this, and these conditions happen to be Higgins modular space on C. So that's how it came about. And then some other things tell us that they must be holomorphic maps. Okay, and so how we got the global filter invariance was basically by shrinking C. And all these computations are actually done physically, but they all have a mathematical interpretation. So for those of you who are aware of the physics, this guy actually comes from the interaction terms in the action. Yeah, you bring them down, there's four Fermi interaction terms. So you can think of it mathematically as being composed of four forms that are wedged together, okay? And exponentially in an exponent kind of uh, expansion, like x plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over two factorial. Okay, so that's why you have this, this Euler class thing coming in. Okay, that's the reason, all right? Okay. So the, <clears throat> this guy here is also a number. Okay, the number here is the pullback of the symplectic form on mx to sigma. Okay, we have a map of sigma to mx, right? So the pullback of the symplectic form, okay, of mx onto sigma, okay? And then this itself is Fushan class. So it, it has, it is a, it's an integer, okay? And then this is the 42 d correspondence, which I mentioned earlier on, and it has been uh, recently proved by some mathematician to be correct. Okay. Okay, 
So M4 will take to the M3 plus R. So I mentioned that, you know, you do that, you can effectively hide this guy and look at it like a 1D theory on this guy. And so this 1D theory is a quantum mechanical theory because uh, a point particle will take uh, uh, the trajectory of a line, right? So it's a one-dimensional quantum field theory or one-dimensional quantum mechanical theory, okay? So it's called quantum mechanical because it means particle, okay? One particle. And then in the physical theory itself, we have this thing called a potential, but look at this. This is the Chen Simons functional. But for an A, that is a connection for GC. Okay, so through this thing here, we are able to derive, okay, of uh, uh, this, this guy here. Okay, we compute the vacuum energy. Yeah, this flow homology here, but a flow homology associated with this kind of MOS functional. So the MOS functional here is actually uh, a connection of GC. So which means that this, so this looks at these equations, if we show to a person who knows instanton flow homology, they'll recognize all these things. The gradient flow equation here, this guy here, everything looks the same to a person who knows instanton flow homology, except the A is now curly A instead of the usual A. Okay, so that's how actually this guy here is secretly the same as instanton flow homology, but for GC. Okay, that's the reason. Then you might wonder why is it becoming GC and not G? We started with a physical theory that is G, right? So it's because in the theory that uh, that's originally formulated by for non-GC, the B is zero. But now you can combine the B here. You see? So in the original formulation or the formulation, the physical formulation that gives you the non-GC case, the instant non-G case, there's no B. But here we have a B. So we can combine the B to become a curly A. That's the reason. Okay, so that's the reason. Right? Okay, so I mentioned after that, we tried to split, right? The three manifold. I say we tried to split the three manifold. So that's what we are, we are trying to do. So we have an M4 here, okay? And then we want to split the three manifold along a Riemann surface C. So of course, in four dimensions, we can't really visualize, but we can logically deduce. Say this line is C. Okay, this is the R plus or R. Okay, and then we want to basically split the block M4 into two blocks. Now, after we split the block here, we want to reduce the C, make it very small. So once we reduce the C and make it very small, we are left with the R plus or the R and the interval. Correct? The interval, this part still exists. Uh, so the R and the interval will give us the open string. So we have two open strings here, the world sheet. Then what happens is this? See, okay. So we have two open strings here. So there are brains here, brains here, brains here, brains here. Now, of course, in the actual theory, we didn't split them. We actually have to glue them back together. So the two strings are then glued back together, actually. Okay. And when these boundary conditions are exactly the same, so you can take it as no boundary, they go back to itself. And therefore, you actually have one open string between two Lagrangian rates. Uh, that's how we are able to get this part here. Okay? So this is the mathematical expression for the physics of this guy. It's actually capturing the spectrum of this guy. But this process is obtained by doing this splitting, okay, or imagining they are being split and then shrinking the C to be small and then putting them back together again. But this entire process is invariant for the physical theory. Okay, so therefore we are able to, you know, equate the physics of this guy here with the physics of the original theory, which was this. So this is how we got the flow correspondence. Okay, yeah. Then later on, as I mentioned, you know, uh, hypercohomology guy, uh, Abu Zayed Malanescu, has been shown, you know, to be given by this Lagrangian, Lagrangian intersection flow homology. And so we make use of this result to put HPE3 side here, and then we can get this guy. This part here I mentioned, the VW flower is secretly the GC. We saw earlier on the Chen Simons is actually curly A. 
right? Yeah. Okay. So, and then we do the S duality, as I told you, then you can get the G to LG. So whatever we have, all can be transposed into the G to the LG. Okay, so whatever we have, everything can be transposed. Okay. Right? And then, uh, if we let the... So again, we could also derive geometric Langlands, as I mentioned. Okay? This one is still not categorification because we're just... Okay, yes, it is categorification. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, because we now have category of hybrids. From like just, you know, vectors just now, flow homology... Numbers in the beginning, the, the buffer return invariance, the summation of the AK, Q, MK, right? Those are all numbers, basically, right? And now we end up getting uh, categories. So you have some kind of categorification going on here also, okay? So this is the this is the, the summary of the categorification. So VW theory on M4, you have a number, okay? Which is what we saw just now. VW theory on... R cos M3, we have a vector. We had this. Uh, a, this basically the, the Zs generate, give you a, a generating series of vectors, basically, if you saw earlier, right? Okay. This one generating series of A's and Q's of numbers, basically. Okay, so and then this guy uh, here gave us generating series of, of, of categories of A brains. Okay, and then now, so what we do is here, you see, M4, we introduce a boundary, M3. Then from the boundary here, we introduce a boundary, okay, of C on an interval. Then here, we introduce to this guy a boundary, basically, of S1. Okay, and then here, we break up the S1. Okay, we break it up. This guy here, we break it up into an interval at 0 to 1. And so then we will get a tree category. All right? So, and the number is associated to M4, the vector is associated to M3, the category of brains was associated to the Riemann surface C, the two category is associated to the S1, the three category is associated to the two points, zero and one, at the end of the intervals. Okay, so you can see that we can successfully get uh, two category, three category. Okay, and this, is, this can be derived from the physics, actually. Okay, so what are the so what are these things? So the brains we know. So what are these two categories? So the two category here is actually the two category of 2D boundaries of the 3D theory on this after you shrink the S1. We had to shrink, right? So you remember for this guy here, the M3 had to be hidden, so we get 1D theory on this guy. This one here, the C had to be shrunk, so we get a 2D theory of the strings on this guy to get the brains. So same thing, we have to shrink this. Now, after you shrink this, the two category here is associated with the S1, okay? It's assigned to the S1, but what are they? They are the boundaries, the two category of 2D boundaries of the 3D theory on this. So you look at this guy here, you will see that they are faces. They are faces of a, of a, a long uh, rectangular block, okay? And so the faces themselves uh, of this 3D theory, uh, they are boundaries. And the two categories are that of the 2D boundaries. Okay, the 2D boundaries obey certain uh, rules from the physics that shows that they are uh, objects in the two category. Okay, they are categories of categories. Right? Okay. So these 2D boundaries can be realized as surface effects. Never mind, just a physical statement. So what is important is this. Now, let's say if we take G to be a billion, U1 or factors of U1, Okay, and real tau to be zero. Okay, that is the, the, the quantum case. Okay, if you remember. Then one can show, okay, this was shown in this paper by Kapustin. The category of such surface defects is a two category of module categories over the Fukaya flow category of T2. Okay. So S duality gives us, again, the map, this thing. So the T2 becomes the LT2. So where LT2 is the dual torus with the radius of the circles inverted. Okay, so in a way, you can think of the tau goes to minus one over tau. So the, the torus is a complex structure as tau. If you swap the circles, the long side with the short side, then your tau actually goes to minus one over tau, right? You invert the, 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 the torus. Okay, so, so that's what S-duality does, and you have this statement. 
from the physics. So similarly, the three category will be the three category of 3D boundaries. Okay, that sit at the two ends of the interval. This guy, the 3D, the 3D boundaries are this. Okay. Yeah. And then this 3D category will be assigned to a point. You'll be associated with a point. Okay. This guy here associated with the S1. Okay, it's it's it's, it's labeled by the S1 here. Okay, so then we have this. This one doesn't show you the categorification. It just shows you all the links that we saw just now before the categorification. Okay, let's conclude. So we have physically derived a novel VW invariant of M4. It's a number, okay? We have a 42D correspondence between VW invariants and global return invariants. And that conjecture that we have suggested has been proved now, proven already, okay? We have recast boundary VW theory as a 1D SQM model on the R, okay? And that allowed us to derive, you know, the flow homology. And then later on, we, we and, you know, we cut the M4 blocks into two parts, right? And that allowed us to derive the Waffa Witten Atia flow correspondence, which in turn allowed us to generalize the Abu Zayim and Lesko conjecture, okay? Then S duality, as you saw, it maps all these things from the G type to the LG type. And we were also able to, you know, derive the quantum geometric lines correspondence in terms of the brains. Okay, in terms of the brains, when we started to consider the the the, the case where 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 the the four manifold was C cross I cross R, okay, and then we are able to get geometric lines correspondence. Geometric lines correspondence is actually a correspondence in terms of, of categories of objects. Okay, so that's what we did. Okay, it's a one category. So, and we are able to do that. So our physical framework, as we showed that if we continue to introduce more category, more boundaries into the boundary that you introduce, then you can actually get uh, two categories and even three categories. Okay, so in that way, you can get a higher categorification, uh, objects of higher categories from the physical theory. And then you apply S duality again to it. You can still get a map of two categories as we showed. At least two categories, three categories. You you can also do that, but we didn't really show in this talk. But the point is that you can have categories which are associated with, from with G to LG also. All right, and that is something which is is, is mathematically very very uh, interesting, I believe. All right, okay. Thank you for listening. It's it's a uh, okay. I spent quite a bit of time. Uh, we thank much. you very much. Okay. So, uh, Meng Chuan, really, it was a very impressive talk. I mean, uh, combining these two high-end theories in physics and mathematics and explaining it in uh, in a really nice way, I mean, is uh, really fantastic. I mean, we all enjoyed your talk. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the uh, modular uh, function that you have uh, attached is kind of... Uh, a generalization of a uh, theta function probably, right? Yes, 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 yes. So those kind of things, yeah. So of course, yeah, they, they look like modular forms, right? They look like right. modular forms. Yeah, correct. So that's that's the point. Yeah, they in, in so in physics, they naturally appear like modular forms. And it's not unexpected because S duality is really modular transformation. Oh, I see. So if a physical theory has S duality, usually you can express it looking like a modular form. And the very first, uh, most basic modular forms were the data functions and all that that appeared in mathematics. That's right. Correct. Yeah. And uh, the way you uh, categorify the theories resemble uh, TQ, axiomatic TQFT construction, kind of. Yes, correct. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, if you look at all, okay, so this all, so if you look at all these, uh, higher category theories that right. people like Lurie and those people who are, who are doing. Yeah, is there is a physical parallel to it. Like, you know, you just add more and more structure into the four manifold. So in the physical, okay, of course, in the mathematical one, it's more abstract. But physically, to get higher category, you just have to decompose like from this to this to this to this to this. Like you just go down like that. Of course, there is a limit. If it's four dimensions, you can only go up to three category. But... If you play like five or six or seven dimensions, you can have even more down to like five categories. That's also possible. Yeah. So, so the point is that why is it possible for us to see the higher, higher categories? Because 
in the physical theory, we see that the objects obey structures within you know other structures, higher structures. So that's the that's the that's the point. The behavior is very nice. It just happens to have this kind of uh, behavior. Yeah, we didn't expect that actually. But then later on, when we investigated into the physics, we realized that yeah, okay, so this guy you know maps this to this, but yet these maps are being mapped by another map basically. Then we realized that oh, okay, there are high categories that are involved. So that kind of thing. So it's like so the point is that the physical theory will have some kind of map. And then after that, you have maps that map the maps, and then maps that map the maps of the maps. So that's how the higher categories appear in the physical theory. Yeah. So symmetries of the symmetries of the symmetries of the symmetries, kind of. Yeah, yes, correct. That's right. That's right. Your symmetries are similar. So I think, in my opinion, is, is this. Okay, if you ask me, in physics, right, in the late 1920s, when quantum mechanics was first discovered, uh, the people, so Herbert Val at that point, he was also studying group representation theory. Okay, yeah. And actually, at that point in time, nobody knew, uh, except for this physicist called Eugene Wigner, he's, he's Hungarian, okay. And he realized that actually the natural language for quantum mechanics was actually group representation theory. Okay, and so Wigner saw Hermann Wahl's work and introduced it to the physics world. And from there, quantum mechanics was made a lot clearer, you know, what it's about. is because the, the natural structure, the language was group representation theory. Now, today, if you ask me personally, if you look at string theory, if you look at uh, high dimensional theories which have objects that are high dimensions. So string theory tells you they are not just strings, they are brains. Not just points, not just strings, membranes, two brains, three brains, four brains, five brains, objects of higher dimensions. And it looks to me that the time is right for people to explore higher structures, okay, things in higher structures, all these kind of that pertain to the symmetries of high dimensional objects. And then that could be the natural language for string theory, actually. I mean, there's a, I have, I have some friends who are working on that, actually. You know, there are, there's a group in Abu Dhabi. They work on higher structures. Maybe you can invite them to give a talk. So he shall uh, here. Schreiber, right? Yes, 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 yes. I know that. They are my friends, actually. They are my friends. I'm, I'm very close to them, actually. So I've always wanted to work on that kind of thing, actually, to be honest. You know, because I think that is the answer to it. You know, but because obviously they are the experts. They already know so much more. It's hard for me to suddenly catch up with them. So I'm only like still doing my own thing here, which is interesting, okay? But I also have a side interest in what Sati, Schreiber, Fiorenza and those people are actually doing. I think they are onto something basically. Yeah, so, and there's also some group in Edinburgh who works on that, you know, Christian Zeman and those people. They also work on the jobs and all those things, higher structures. So I think, you know, higher structures is the new kind of group theory for physics, yeah. So I think uh, there is potential in its applications to, to understanding. Because now in physics, everybody is asking, what is M theory? You know, uh, you know, people like Witten and all, they, they, they have kind of stopped working on M theory also because they, they you know, sort of didn't find any new physical insights into M theory. But I think, you know, the, the answer to what is M theory, maybe it's time for us to do what Wigner did in 1930s which is to look at structures in mathematics, in particular higher structures, and see whether they can be the natural language for these things. So like, you know, connection to forms and all that, the jobs and all these things. These are very natural to describe like charged strings, basically. Because you see, a one form connection is now understood as the gauge field for a point. But if you have a charged string, basically, then you need a two form connection. Okay, and a two-form connection is like a jerk, basically. And that kind of, that's like the high structures we are talking about here. And in string theory, there's not just this, in, in the whole M theory, there's not just the string. You have a, a two, two membrane, a five membrane, and all these are also coupled to like higher, higher degree forms, basically. There's some symmetry. So essentially, the study of higher degree forms and their symmetries would be in a natural language to understand M theory. Yeah. So that is what I, I feel, basically. Yes. 
Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Just a comment, and I, I, I would rather not speak. I, I have a lot more reading to do myself. But um, oh. talk, talking about the relationship uh, with your friends in Abu Dhabi and the high representation theory, relating yeah. that to M theory, maybe would treating these theories as an aperiodic signal help? Because then you could think of it in some some ways as um, in, maybe I don't know if that would help. A aperiodic signal. Aperiodic signal, as in you mean like a. A wave, a signal, like uh, what? What do you or mean by even it? or even periodic when it's relevant? Like when it's relevant to think of this as periodic signal, um, and maybe try to use Fourier methods to to relate. Oh, okay, between okay. Fields. okay, yes, okay. So Fourier transforms, uh, have their generalizations, which have found uh, their users in understanding, uh, uh, these things called t dualities in string theory, okay. So, okay. like, for example, there's this thing called the Fourier Bukai transform, okay, in mathematics, which is an elaboration of what you just said. So, Fourier transforms are, you know, on signals, okay, they transform the time domain to the frequency domain, okay? And yeah. these Fourier transforms, you're right, I mean, there is some evidence that uh, these dualities are somewhat related to Fourier transforms. So, some mathematicians have been trying to study dualities in string theory uh, in terms of Fourier transforms. And there's this thing called the Fourier Mukai transform. And the Fourier Mukai transform is essentially the mathematically rigorous way to understanding this duality in string theory called T duality. Okay. So you could think of, yeah, like for example, like this guy here. Okay. It could be related to a Fourier Mukai transform. Yeah. So when T squared is mapped to LT squared, it's actually a T duality because you make the small circle, you invert the radii of the circle. When you, when you exchange them, in some sense, you're inverting the radii of the circle. One becomes big, one becomes small. So it's actually like, it could be a Fourier Mukai transform. It could be related to that. So in terms of, of signal transformations, as you mentioned, this could be one example. Thank so, you also for the intro introduction to the Fourier for Mukai transform. That gets me really interested in two T dualities. So thank you for yeah. the introduction. Yeah, most welcome. Yeah. Well, not not so much introduction, but you know what I mean. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You're most welcome. I'm ha ha happy to 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 share uh, everything I know with you guys. Yeah. Uh, any more questions or comments? Okay, so let's think once more, Ming Chua. Yeah. So, so, I, so I, I hope it was uh, understandable. Uh, well, it I, was I, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I really liked it. And I got some feeling about uh, what is going on in the physics side, I mean. Uh, so thank you very much, I mean. Okay. Uh, right. So two weeks later, uh, we will have our next meeting. Uh, oh, Elena from France, she will talk on uh, a new construction of DG categories. That's her uh, uh, seminar talk. So I will close the recording now.